Okay. Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. And uh, I think this might be the fifth lesson uh, in, I guess, a series we're calling Mid East Matters. Um, so, Genesis chapter 12. Uh, we were there last time. And uh, we were looking at uh, what's called the Abrahamic Covenant. The Abrahamic Covenant. And uh, I believe that uh, when our last president uh, was leaving office, he had, uh, was trying to broker some kind of a deal over there in the Middle East that was uh, called the Abraham Accords, uh, which was trying to bring all the Middle Eastern countries together to recognize Israel um, as a legitimate state. And, of course, that's the issue. They don't believe it's a legitimate state. And so they believe that, uh, and I've read you these things before from the different uh, uh, documents, especially the Hamas uh, organization, and uh, they're not interested in anything but destroying Israel and taking over every inch of ground there that they now possess. Uh, they're not compromising, they're not negotiating, uh, they don't believe in a two-state solution and they don't want one. And if you don't go along with that, then they will kill you for that. Um, if you don't side with them. And so, um, and I looked up the word Hamas. I didn't look it up, but I found it out there. Somebody posted something out there about Hamas. Uh, that's a Hebrew word for violence and cruelty. How many of you saw that? That's past floating around. The word for, the Hebrew word for the Hamas is cruelty and violence, which is what exactly they are. And uh, I saw the other day um, our current president um, talking about uh, how that, you know, we're negotiating, we're doing these things, and we still, you know, uh, are looking for a day when peace will come in the Middle East. We're working towards that, and um, they're, they're still looking for a two-state solution. Uh, that's the answer, you have a Palestinian state and an Israeli state. That's what they've been trying to do for 100 years, 50 years, uh, today, and uh, no president has been able to get that done. Um, and when they tried to get it done, when they uh, created somewhat of it, when they had the Palestinians there in Gaza get their own government, um, that government has been corrupt. And uh, I'll say that you know the Palestinian people are suffering because of the terrorists that run their 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 country or whatever it is. Uh, but uh, most of those people will side with the terrorists. It seems like so. There is no compromise. And when the president gets up and says, well, we want to uh, work for a, a two-state solution, you can't do that because the uh, Hamas and the terrorist groups that run those uh, neighborhoods and communities and things like that, like Gaza and the West Bank, they're not interested in a two-state solution. They're just not. They want to kill the Jews. That's what they want to do. And for some reason, our presidents and statesmen get up there and talk as if they never said those things. And we learned from Hitler when he wrote Mein Kampf that everything he said, he, he meant. And so he wrote it out. You know, what the average liberal <coughs> progressive uh, person, uh, their idea is, uh, I just can't believe they would do that. I just can't believe they would do that. Um, when somebody does something wrong, and it's like, um, I mean, when I was a kid and graduated high school almost 50 years ago. Um, you know, parents didn't really know what was going on then. And you would think that the generation that grew up in the 60s and 70s would have more of a clue of what's going on with their kids growing up because they knew what they did with their parents and when they were growing up and how they got away with stuff. And, and uh, you know, their parents back then said, well, I can't believe that anybody would believe that and do stuff like that. And still we've got the same thing going on. Well, I can't believe that they would do that. When it comes to all kinds of the social issues, the political issues going and religious issues going on today, and uh, so uh, people are just blind and they're, they're willingly ignorant of a lot of things. A lot of people just got too much stuff going on to keep up with everything. So they, they don't and they can't keep up with stuff. But um, anyway, um, Genesis chapter 12 here. And we're talking about um, uh, the Abrahamic covenant. We talked last week a little bit about the... Uh, what's called what we call the components of the promise, that is what makes up the promise that God gave, and the promise is in Genesis 12, 2 and 3. So let's look at that again. God's speaking to Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, verse 2. 
He said, I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And so we see that's become true, that passed, that came to pass. Uh, a great nation came out of Abraham. Uh, he was called, his name Abraham means the father of many nations. That's what that means. And so uh, when God changed his name from, well, right here in verse 1, God said to Abram, which means high father. But later he changes his name to Abraham, which means father of many nations, which is in fulfillment of this promise in verse 2. I'll make of thee a great nation. Uh, and he did. And I will bless thee. So he blessed Abraham. He protected him, watched over him. Uh, God's providential uh, 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 dealings in Abraham's life show that. And he said, I'll make thy name great. Well, his name was great back in the day. Um, he fought some battles. Uh, he gained a name for himself uh, as a warrior even. Um, and then uh, throughout time, uh, up to today now, Abraham is one of the greatest characters in uh, Jewish history. Uh, I guess Moses, according to Jewish history, unsaved Jews, Moses would be the greatest, uh, followed by uh, Abraham, or maybe they're the same, I don't know, maybe they're equal. But Abraham and Moses definitely are the most important people in the Jewish history, according to the Jews. Um, and Abraham is, uh, is uh, the um, uh, person that uh, all Jews uh, refer to as the father of their nation, and the father of their people, uh, the Arabs, uh, particularly the Muslims, uh, will go back to Abraham and say that Abraham is their father as well because uh, Abraham had uh, Ishmael, who was not the chosen seed, but he did have Ishmael, and the tribes that came out of Ishmael, God said he was going to bless them uh, because they were the children of Abraham also. And so they multiplied and become great nations as well. And by great nations, we don't mean necessarily great in the sense of amazing, stupendous, wonderful, great in the sense of, wow, you know, there's this, you know, great just means bigger. It means large. Um, for instance, uh, you have uh, Memphis, Tennessee. That's a large city. Then you have greater Memphis. What's greater Memphis? What's greater than Memphis? Come on. What's greater? Greater Memphis is the surrounding area outside the city limits within the county. That's greater Memphis, the greater Memphis area. Um, and so uh, it's talking about size. It's talking about being large, many. And so when he says, I'm going to make a great nation of you, he means there uh, a large nation. He says a great name. Now that might be reference to great in the sense of uh, awesome, amazing, you know, well-known, etc., something like that. Uh, but you've got to look at how those words are used. But anyway, so God has done that. He's created, uh, the, the nation of Israel came out of that. The Arab nations came out of him. Uh, and then uh, not only do the Muslims and the Jews um, claim Abraham as uh, their you know, spiritual father, but the Christian church does as well. Uh, he's not our physical father. We're not physical descendants of Abraham. Uh, but spiritually speaking, we are the children of Abraham if we have put our faith in Jesus Christ as our Savior. Okay, so anyway, um, and then he mentions there, he mentions this land in verse number 2. He said, I'm going to make a great nation of you, verse number 3, and I'll bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee, and, and, uh, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. And so again, we, we pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Uh, we want to pray for them, give them prayer support. Uh, we want to give them moral support when they do the right thing. Uh, and again, it doesn't, to support Israel and be a blessing to Israel does not mean that we approve everything they say and do. Um, I mean, there may, you may have some disagreements, and some people do, with how they go about and do things and what's going on over there, but yet uh, we're still supposed to be uh, those who pray for them uh, and, and bless them in whatever way we can to be a blessing to them. And uh, so anyway, it doesn't mean we agree with everything they do, but it does mean that we honor them as... Uh, God would have us to do, to be a blessing to them. Um, and he said, I'll curse those that curse you. And if you look through history, the nations that have uh, mistreated the Jews have uh, historically been nations that have fallen by the wayside. Um, France persecuted them. Spain persecuted them. Uh, Italy persecuted them. England persecuted them. German persecuted them. 
Um, and uh, a lot of these nations are no longer first-rate powers like they once were because of that, I believe. And uh, some of them are second-rate and third-rate powers now because of how they mistreated the Jewish people. Uh, England itself, which was instrumental in uh, helping to bring about uh, the uh, nation, the state of Israel, um, mistreated them and uh, lied to them and um, backed out of treaties and things like that and pretty much left them hanging at a certain time. But there were other things going on there, too. The British... Uh, there were some. There were Jewish uh, uh, guerrilla fighters that uh, became some of the Jewish leaders that we know of in our lifetime that um, were trying to get the British to leave because uh, the British were uh, were nigging on some of their promises and things like that weren't fulfilling the things and so uh, there was uh, military and guerrilla warfare going on. Uh, the Jewish people against the British, and the British finally left, which is what the Jews wanted them to do. Uh, so a lot of history there that uh, people don't give or realize that took place there. But anyway, uh, all you can say is war and revolution is a mess. That's all you can say, really. Um, but um, anyway, he says this. Uh, he says that God, God is going to give them a land, a land. Uh, look at uh, Genesis chapter uh, 13 here. Genesis chapter 13. And in Genesis chapter 13, look here at um, um, 14, verse 14. And the Lord said unto Abram, after that Lot was separated from him, Lift up now thine eyes, and look from the place where thou art, northward, and southward, and eastward, and westward. So he tells Abram, I want you to look north. Look south, look east, look west. And he says this. He says, For all the land which thou seest, all the way to the horizon, to thee will I give it, and to thy seed forever. Amen. So God says there that I'm going to give you this land, and to your seed, your descendants. Um, now, he says there in verse number 16, and, I'll make, and I will make thy seed as the dust of the earth, it's a lot of people. It's a great nation. So that if a man can number the dust of the earth, then shall thy seed also be numbered. Arise, walk through the land in the length of it and in the breadth of it, for I will give it unto thee. Then Abram, Abram removed his tent and came and dwelt in the plain of Mamre, which is in the Hebron, and built there an altar unto the Lord. So there God tells Abraham, according to the scripture, that he, he, he's going to give him all of that land. So when uh, Abraham is here in Canaan land, him and Lot, and the previous verses there, had their, 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 uh, their uh, workers or whatever, their sheep herders, had uh, uh, some disagreements about stuff, and so they decided to part company. And so Abraham told Lot, what, you take what you want, and I'll take the rest. And so Lot takes... Uh, the valley there that he mentioned there, and then uh, Abraham has the rest of it, and God says to Abraham, okay, now you can have everything that you see. So he sees everything there. Now, he even goes beyond that, because if you look at some maps, um, it shows that uh, uh, the river of Egypt, uh, possibly the Nile River here, uh, all the way over to the, uh, I believe it's the Euphrates River, um, that is what property God actually gave to Israel. Is this all right in here? Which which, which encompasses uh, the Sinai Peninsula, which is under Egyptian control now. You see the maps this week on any of the news programs, and they're showing where the... Uh, uh, there's Gaza right there, and right down here is the border between Gaza, Israel, and Egypt right here, and, it, and it's the Sinai Peninsula right there. Uh, back in 1973 when uh, the Egyptians and other nations there um, attacked Israel in 1973 in what they called the Yom Kippur War, um, they caught Israel kind of off guard and uh, Israel uh, had to fight back and defend themselves. And you know what Israel did? How do we know what Israel did in the Sinai Peninsula? I believe all the way over to the Suez Canal. They took it. They took it. They were attacked. They retaliated. 
and they pushed the Egyptians back, and they took the Sinai Peninsula. Amen. How many think they should have kept it? How many think they had a legal right to keep it after being attacked? Yes. Well, you know, the world, the United Nations, and the you know the president of the United States, and the, you know, all the uh, foreign you know experts, and said, and Henry Kissinger, and everybody said, uh, y'all need to give that back to Egypt. What about the spoils of war? They, they took everything. That they, just, they didn't take all, they didn't go into Egypt, but they didn't take the Sinai Peninsula. Besides, I don't know what's there, the desert. So maybe the Jews decided, you know what, that's just too much to take care of anyway, and we'll just let them have it back. Maybe it's a worthless piece of real estate. But in any case, according to what we read in the scripture in the Old Testament, that, does, that Sinai Peninsula does belong to Israel. Uh, all the way over to the river of Egypt, and then all over the, to the Euphrates River, which is here, all the way down to here, which means Jordan, Syria, Iran, Iraq, um, and Kuwait, um, Lebanon. That all is part of the real estate that God gave to them, and also parts of Saudi Arabia, which is right down here. Um, now, when it says there, they'll be as the dust of the earth and uh, so on and so forth, uh, and um, that's how many they're going to be. That's how many Jews there will be, he says, uh, and his descendants. And uh, that may be going into the millennium even, possibly. Uh, well, maybe that's really going to be fulfilled to that degree. But at some point, they will get that land back, and they will get it back, I believe, probably in the, in the millennium. God will give it back to them. So there's some real estate there. There's some there's some real land going on there that they're that they're that they've been um, bequeathed by the Lord. Now look at Genesis chapter 15. Genesis chapter 15, and this is one reason why many people uh, hate the Bible uh, because they uh, don't like the fact that it uh, uh, gives prominence to the Jewish people, um, the nation of Israel. And uh, God said that they would, you know, the world was going to hate the nation of Israel. And that's a fact it does. And even when this last attack has taken place, uh, there's, you know, lots of people that, that the tide is kind of turning against them. You can kind of see that if you watch the news and keep up with current events and stuff. That everything's kind of turning against the Jews now because, you know, of all the propaganda being put out by um, the uh, terrorist side. And for some reason, the world sides with that. Uh, why is that? Well, because Satan is the god of this world, and he's blinded the minds of people who uh, have rejected Christ. And so if you believe the Bible, then you're going to believe this, and it's going to affect how you view foreign policy over there in Israel. Um, look at uh, verse number, um, let's see, Genesis chapter 15, and look here at... Um, Verse number 18. Verse number 18. In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, Unto thy seed have I given this what? Land. Land. From the river of Egypt. Um, there might have been something called the river of Egypt, but I'm not sure about that, so I'm going to go with the Nile River. We know that's the river of Egypt, right? Um, what's the river of the United States of America, you think? The Mississippi River. Mississippi River. That's the river, yeah, right? That's the river. Um, let's see, what's the river of South America? Amazon. The Amazon. 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 That's the river, right? The great so, river. what's that? The Great River. Yeah, so what is the river of Egypt? Well, it's likely the Nile River. Okay, so if that's the case, then what does he say here from the river of Egypt to where? The Euphrates. That's what I just said. The one we just looked at right there. See right there? Like that. Um, so look at it again. Uh, verse uh, 18. Uh, unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates. So there you have that. Um, now, look at um, also, let's look over at uh, Genesis chapter... Um, Let's see. Well, you get the picture there, right? God gave it to Abraham and gave that land to him. Now, he gives it to his seed. 
Uh, the seed, there's two kinds of ways of looking at it. One is the seed, which is Christ, who comes of Abraham. That's what Paul's talking about in Galatians. Uh, but then there is the physical, literal seed of Abraham, uh, who are the descendants of Abraham. And you've got to make the distinction between the two. Uh, if you don't make the distinction between the two, then you're going to think the seed, every time it occurs, refers to Christ. And if that's the case, then uh, it's not a literal interpretation. The land is not literal, etc. Uh, but it is a literal. And when he uses that word seed here in Genesis, the places we looked at here, um, ultimately it could be referring to Christ um, as the Messiah, but it's also definitely in the context referring to the seed in the sense of his descendants uh, that come out of his loins. Um, and some people get those things mixed up, and you get those things mixed up, you start spiritualizing um, all the Old Testament when it comes to these things, and it uh, makes you become what's called post-millennial, which means that you believe that we're going to bring the kingdom in as the church. And when we bring the kingdom in and we have a thousand years of peace, then Christ will return to claim that kingdom. That's post-millennialism. How many ever heard of that? Okay. So... Uh, I just read something the other day, um, and it was uh, some history about, uh, uh, in America there was what's called the first Great Awakening, and when they had that, they didn't know it was the first, it was just the Great Awakening, that was in the 1730s and 40s, um, and so the prominent figures in that was Jonathan Edwards, uh, George Whitfield, and John Wesley, to some degree, and um, then uh, what happened was is that uh, people started preaching, George Whitfield was a famous English evangelist who came to America, and he preached. He was uh, even uh, acquainted with Abraham Lincoln, I mean Benjamin Franklin, Benjamin Franklin, who was a deist, um, and he was not a Christian uh, in the sense of being born again and saved and all that. But um, George Whitfield and him became somewhat acquainted while they were here. And supposedly, uh, Benjamin Franklin actually helped him write some tracts and stuff like that, because he was a printer. Anyway, many people got saved under George, George Whitfield's evangelistic ministry and campaigns along the eastern seaboard. And uh, what that did was, is it brought people back to God, back to the Bible, and uh, people say, look at history, even secular history, they say that that kind of consolidated the American people and prepared them for the revolution that was going to come. And so, anyway, after the first Great Awakening, uh, next comes the second Great Awakening, which was around 1800. And uh, that took place in Kentucky, um, parts of what's now West Virginia, I suppose, uh, parts of Tennessee. They had a thing called the Cumberland Revival. Anybody know what the Cumberland Gap is? Cumberland Gap is what Daniel Boone found, right? Open up the way into Kentucky. Um, and so, uh, anyway, around 1800 or so, uh, there were some uh, Methodists and Presbyterians and Baptists um, that started having revivals in those areas, which was wilderness pretty much at that time. And so a lot of circuit riding preachers are going around preaching. Uh, they would have revival meetings in different churches, and they would have what, what, they, what came to be called camp meetings, camp meetings. And these camp meetings, these guys would preach, and literally they would, um, they'd have tree stumps, like sitting over here, and then one guy would get up and start preaching to a couple hundred people that were gathered around, and then 100 yards down the way, there was another stump, another preacher was on that, preaching to a couple hundred people, and then, oh, well, here's another stump, another preacher's preaching. And they'd have all kinds of preaching going on, and they'd stay there for days and weeks, on him. They'd have 20,000 people show up out there in the woods to listen to preaching. And uh, people would get saved. Um, and um, then uh, when they got saved, and they said that the church memberships of the Methodists and the Baptists particularly uh, started increasing uh, quite a lot. And uh, anyway, uh, in doing that, that also changed the uh, tone of America. Uh, got them back to the Bible, church, and God. And a lot of that took place. Um, some of the figures in that, one of the primary figures in that was a guy named Sam, not Sam Jones, but um, uh, Peter Cartwright. I mean, has anybody heard of Peter Cartwright? Peter Cartwright was a Methodist preacher, circuit riding preacher, who rode around 
um, all those areas and would preach. And then he also helped uh, with the camp meetings. And he would preach at the camp meetings and stuff like that. Anyway, he was quite a character, Peter Cartwright. Um, I think one time somebody, while he was preaching, started throwing rocks at him. Saying, there is no God, there is no God and throwing rocks and things and stuff at him. I have to look it up to make sure the exact thing had happened there, but Cartwright was the kind of guy that just wasn't going to take that. So he jumped down off his tree stump or where he was preaching from, and he, he chased that guy through a field and over a fence and got him on the ground and said, I'm going to beat the living daylights out of you. When I get done, you're going to see if there's a God or not. I guess he threatened to kill him you know, for throwing rocks at him. That's assault. It's a battery. You've got a right to retaliate. Was he really going to do that? I don't know, but, you know, he scared the living daylights out of that guy. Preachers aren't supposed to do that. They're supposed to throw rocks, I guess they're supposed to just, like, you know, take it, right? Whatever. But Cartwright didn't do that. Um, and so, anyway, uh, he did a lot of things like that. But um, it was rough and tumble back in those days, in that area. Amen? Um, so, uh, anyway, that happened, and then, uh, um, as that happened, also, there was another one that came along called the Third Great Awakening in the 1850s. This is where I'm getting to. And so when, I, when you get to the 1850s, they have a revival in America. And um, what comes out of that, unfortunately, is something called the social gospel. They got away from the saving gospel. You must repent. You must be born again. You must be saved and all that kind of stuff. They were still preaching that, but they started adding to it uh, the social gospel. And that was they started wanting to help people out, take care of people, and solve poverty and uh, all these kinds of things, which is all good. And the church is supposed to help out in those areas. And there's no question the church is supposed to help out in those areas, right? And the church used to do those things. But uh, in the midst of all that, they got away from the spiritual side, just got to the social side. And so we have what's called the social gospel, which is that, uh, uh, you know, instead of preaching being born again, the new birth, and uh, God uh, creating a new creature in Christ in the individual is that instead of addressing that, we're going to address his outer needs. He needs food. He needs shelter. He needs clothes. He needs education. Uh, all these kinds of things. And that's what we've got to do. Well, you've got to do that, but you also got to... Uh, it's like the mission. The mission... Uh, most missions, it's like this. Most rescue missions that are good missions, it's like this. You can come. You can stay. We'll put you up. We'll feed you. But uh, before you eat the hot dog tonight, you're going to have to hear some preaching. If you don't stay for the preaching, you get no hot dogs. No mac and cheese. Whatever, right? You're getting nothing. We'll put you back on the street. And it's a private organization. They can do that. You say, well, should they do that? Well, they're trying to help people, and some people don't want help, and some people don't know what help looks like. But uh, many people get saved in a rescue mission because they stay near the preaching. And they understand that's what they're supposed to do. That's, that's the thing. You want something to eat, you've got to stay and hear the preaching. Um, and so if you do it that way, that's one thing. But when you pull back on the preaching, and uh, what happened was is a lot of unsaved, liberal-minded, religious people got involved in this stuff and started carrying it forward, and uh, we have the welfare state that we got today. Now, what they were, now what, well, the point of this was this. I do have a point. That third great awake in the 1850s or so, they brought about the social gospel to the exclusion of the, of the saving gospel that addressed spiritual needs over time. Uh, what they believed was is that they had to solve all the problems of the world, poverty, crime, etc., whatever, right, uh, and hunger and all these things. And once they did that and could get that done, and what, they're called, what, they, what they were doing was trying to bring in the kingdom and if they could bring in that thousand-year kingdom of peace, then Jesus Christ would come back. That's post-millennialism. That is the, on paper, that is, uh, if it had to change, I don't think they changed it, but on paper, that is the position of the Southern Baptist Convention. Post-millennialism. Uh, even though many of them are pre-millennial, like we are. Um, but for some reason, the powers that be, on paper, it's, it's been post-millennialism forever. Um, and so we're not trying to bring in the kingdom. We're trying to get people into the kingdom. And how do you get people into the kingdom? Well, you can't enter the kingdom unless what? John chapter 3. What do you got to be to get into the kingdom? 
You've got to be born again according to Jesus, right? In John chapter 3. Except a man be born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And so they're trying to bring in the kingdom, a lot of these people. And a lot of these people are unsaved people. There's a lot of unsaved people out there that aren't even really true Christians. Um, they're just superficial Christians in name. Uh, they have organizations out there trying to help, and that's good and everything. And if you need help and they help you, thank God for it. Uh, but they're not addressing the spiritual needs. And uh, that's the most important thing there. If you can... If you can change a man on the inside, it's going to change his outside. Uh, if you just change him on the outside, that doesn't do anything on the inside. I mean, you can help people out. You can give them all kinds of things. You can build houses for them and communities for them. And in five years, they're going to be dumps again because the people on the inside are not good people. They're unsaved people. Um, the, the, the saying is this, and it goes, goes like this. There's a saying that goes like this. Um, um, the social gospel puts a new coat on the old man. The saving gospel puts a new man inside the old coat. Think about that for a second. If you put a new coat on an old man, old sinner, not born again, and he doesn't get changed on the inside by the gospel, you may put a new coat on the old man. That old man's going to stay an old man on the inside. And eventually, it may be that, that old co the new coat's going to be an old tattered coat because he's still a bum on the inside. Whereas if you put a new man, that means getting them saved, and they receive Christ as Savior, and they become a new creature in Christ, then that new man there is going to be cleaned up on the inside, and it's just going to naturally, the outflow is simply going to be, he's going to clean himself up on the outside. And he might be able to afford probably to go buy his own coat. <laughs> right? Because he's going to be industrious. He's going to work. Uh, he's going to have biblical character. And that's what's going to happen there. So anyway, um, there's this thing where they're trying to bring in the kingdom and that's because they spiritualize all these things in the Old Testament about Abraham, the Abrahamic covenant, uh, and Israel, and the real estate. Uh, and they spiritualize everything. Uh, to the point that uh, the Bible doesn't even, you can't, you can't be, read the Bible literally about these things. And when you do that, you get off onto this heresy, which leads to a social gospel where people aren't getting saved. Uh, they're just, uh, there's no gospel there. And, and the more you talk to people and read these things and listen to these things, you see that. Uh, if you've done any reading and listening and things like that. Uh, and so the gospel gets compromised because we're trying to help as many people as we can. And so we don't want to offend them with the gospel, so we'll get them in this way, and then pretty soon the whole thing just kind of just gets all watered down, and uh, lost people move in and start taking over these organizations, and they may be Christian in name, but in reality they're not born-again people. Uh, does that make sense? Anybody ever read and seen that stuff and know that kind of thing? So Anyway, if you haven't seen it or understood it, hopefully that will help you as you look at some of these things around you. Okay, let's stop with the word of prayer. Father, have me thank you for this day and for your blessings and ask that you might help us now as we go into the next hour. Uh, thank you for each one that's come today. Uh, thank you, Father, for those who are listening in. And thank you, Lord, for those that may be on the way this morning. And we ask that you give us a good day. In Jesus' name, amen.